Hi everybody. So this video today is about educational credentialing and I am going to screen share a PowerPoint that I made with my other administrators of this Facebook group. So just give me one moment to screen share. If you are looking for the webinar, you are going to go to the link that is in the New York State OTs Looking for Change group or the USA OTs Looking for Change group. I also emailed everybody who signed up the link. So you should be able to um, access the link and then watch them. So I'm just going to get started. The first thing I want to talk about is the administrators of this Facebook group. So USA school-based OTs Looking for Change group and the New York State OTs Looking for Change group has a few administrators. There are five of us. So myself, I'm Jamie Spencer. Some people know me as Miss Jamie OT. We also have Joan Savoyne Kirsch, and she is the author of the article in OT Practice, School Administrators, um, OTs as School Administrators. It's a fantastic article if you want to look it up. Serena Zeidler is a good friend of mine, and she is a professor at Toro, and this is um, a passionate issue for her as well. She and I have been working together on it for many years. Kim Wiggins is an occupational therapist from Binghamton, New York, and she's been helping Serena and I with our IRB application, the application for the research study in regards to OTs in New York who are looking for credentialing. And our last administrator is Vera Gallagher. And she's also helping us with these presentations and everything that we've been doing to advocate. So I just wanted to make sure that I addressed this because a lot of people are saying Jamie Spencer. And I think because I have a website and I have no problem being on camera that a lot of people think it's just me, but I'm certainly not working alone. And um, these four other ladies are completely fabulous and they've been so wonderful and we're really working together to get this done. So just, a little bit of information about what we've accomplished in one year. So far, we've got work groups helping with the research surveys. We have multiple surveys that are in development. They are an, a survey for occupational therapists in New York, a survey for teachers in New York, a survey for school administrators in New York, and a survey for parents. And our purpose behind having multiple surveys is we want to really gather the proper information to show AOTA and NYSOTA, what's really happening with occupational therapists in the school-based practice. So again, people online, I've noticed some people are asking questions that don't pertain to school-based practice. This advocacy um, motion, it's for school-based practitioners, not for people who work in private practice and not for other OTs who are working in other areas. It's for people who work within schools. So we, as I said, within one year, we've got five different work groups. We've gathered helpers. OTs are really interested in finding out about this and in helping to gain parity and educational credentialing. I'm going to explain more about that in a minute. But thankfully, we've gotten so many people who have volunteered to help us, and we have kind of grouped them off into who's working on this survey, who's writing an article about school-based practice and burnout. We've got a lot of really great things in the works, and that's only been in within one year. We have a national group, the USA School-Based OTs Looking for Change. We've got over a thousand members in that group. It, and again, it's only been in a year. I started the group in March. Of so we also have multiple state groups. We have Connecticut, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina. We have Missouri opening up any minute. We've got Virginia, we've got Pennsylvania, um, California. We have a lot and they're, we're getting more and more every day and that's so exciting because our goal in this group is to take the work that we've been doing for years for New York and then expand it to the other states. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We don't want you to have to work for years to accomplish what you want within your state. And I know many people watching this are New York, but the other states need this too. So we want to take the work we've done and then help you in your state to tweak it so that it's more appropriate for your state because every state has different legislation and different needs. Our group also started a letter writing campaign. We had OTs in New York writing to our state education department and the directors of state education asking why aren't OTs considered 
eligible for the pathway to leadership? Why can't an OT be an administrator when everyone else can, a social worker, a guidance counselor? It's just not right. I just want to let you know that we have not received a single answer from the New York State Education Department. In our group, we've also been sharing resources to promote occupational therapy. So one of the problems that comes up again and again is that we don't have time. We don't have time to advocate our distinct value, to basically volunteer, to be on extra committees or do anything extra at work that showcases OT because we are so pressed for time. And because very often we're not treated equally within the school district, it impacts our ability to do more or to do our best. So within our group, we've been sharing presentations that we've made with each other. So me personally, I made a core strength in the classroom handout and I shared it with about five OTs throughout the United States. And they're going to be able to now give that presentation, put their name on it and give out that information without having to do hours and hours of work. And I love that because as I know, as we all know, we don't have a lot of time, but we do want to promote O2 and we do want to share our resources and show our worth. So this has been a really cool project that we just started as well. We also wrote to our AOTA state representatives about our concerns. And I actually personally received a phone call from the New York state representative. His name is David Merlot. And he said, what's going on? What's happening with school-based O2? Why are you guys having you know, trouble? And he really cared. And the, the important thing is that we do speak up. We need to let AOTA, we need to let NYSOTA know what is happening with school OTs. And I think historically, we've really kept quiet and haven't voiced our concerns or our complaints. And if they don't know, then they can't help us. We also wrote to AOTA and we asked for a webinar specific to school-based therapists. If you are an AOTA member and you attended the membership week where they gave lots of free webinars and free CEUs to AOTA members, you might have noticed that there was nothing geared towards school, school professionals. And 20% of occupational therapists are school-based. So we need to be represented as well. We need information, we need help, and we need AOTA to know that. So we contacted them and we let them know and we asked, can we please have a webinar about school-based practice, help us? And you know what, they did. They just issued it um, about a week ago or two and now it's available to AOTA members on the AOTA website. So ask and you shall receive, you know, do the work and people will acknowledge it. Amy Lamb, the president of American Occupational Therapy Association reported that that was the best attended webinar for membership week. So that's really exciting. In our group, we've networked and spread the word about this advocacy webinar for OTs and for school OTs. And because of that, everybody showed up and we are stronger together. We are a great, a good, strong group. So that was really exciting. And this is what we've accomplished in one year, our USA school-based OTs looking for change group. So I'm very proud of all of us. And I'm so thankful to everyone who pitched in and helped. Every little bit helps. So just a disclaimer, my name is Miss Jamie OT. I have a website, Miss Jamie OT. And so if you're watching this webinar on my webpage and you click on something else, you might inadvertently end up on an email list of mine or looking at some of the products that I sell or some of the products that I sell for other people. So this is a free webinar and I'm so glad that you're here, but it is attached to my Miss Jamie OT page. So that's just a little disclosure. I am pro educational credentialing. I'm 100% strong believer that we deserve educational credentialing and that educational credentialing is a win-win for school OTs nationally. So I will be, um, you know, always a strong advocate for it. That's not to say that I don't recognize other people's concerns about it, and I will be addressing those today, but just a little disclaimer. I'm pro-ed credentialing, and so is my group and the other administrators with me. I want you to see the little map of New York here and how big New York is. We've got 950 school districts in New York. So a lot of people wrote me questions and I, I asked you to, please what, let me know what your questions are about educational credentialing. Many, 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 most of the questions were, well, you know, what about me where I live and what's happening in my school district, in my building? I can't answer that. It's going to be different, you know, throughout all the different towns, all the different districts. What is consistent is New York State legislation, and I can talk to you about that, and I can talk to you about how it impacts the New York State. Districts are going to interpret legislation differently, and 
that's always going to be how it is. So unfortunately, I won't be able to let you know exactly how it's going to impact you, Susie Jones, in District A and Building B, um, because I, I don't know the answer to that. But I'm going to tell you as much information as I can to help you understand um, you know, where we're going and what's happening. So just a little information about the legislative history that has led us to where we are. There were many um, laws passed in the past that got occupational therapists into the school setting, starting with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act back in 1965. Since then, we've had the Education for All Handicapped Children, which um, spoke about free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And then we had the famous No Child Left Behind, which talked about accountability and teacher performance. ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, that's the new version of um, no child left behind basically so we are working with different populations and ot practitioners are, are considered specialized instructional support personnel so under essa we are not related service providers under idea we are so that's a little confusing but essa basically supports occupational therapists working in the big environment, that we should be working with all children, general education children, that we should not be just pulling children out and working um, with one child at a time, that we should be in the school generalizing our knowledge and training other professionals. So the implications of those laws, as the laws have changed, so has occupational therapy within the school setting. We're really not supposed to be following a medical model anymore and pulling children out and working with them and then bringing them back to the classroom. We're supposed to be working within the classroom. That is what AOTA says is best practice. That doesn't mean that that's always what's happening throughout the nation and throughout New York. So more than 20% of occupational therapy practitioners work in school-based practice. So that really impacts a lot of us. And as these laws have changed, it has impacted many, many professionals. So adding educational credentialing would widen the scope of practice for school-based OTs and OT assistants. So that is why we are pro-educational credentialing. So right here, who has educational credentialing in New York State? This slide always upsets me. So the people that have educational credentialing, and this is considered, they have a license to teach, a license to work in the school system. Teachers, speech therapists, psychologists, counselors, social workers, dental hygiene teachers. I don't know any of those, but they made it in. School attendance teachers and school nurses. Anyone in that category has the right to pursue administrative education in New York State and then go on to become something higher up, such as a principal or a superintendent. Any one of those professions. Now let's look at the category of no, who does not have educational credentialing in New York State? Paraprofessionals, teachers, age, teachers, assistants, bus drivers, maintenance, school clerks, cafeteria workers, administrative assistants, and OTs and PTs. So if you're watching this, I hope that bothers you because it really bothers me. We are the only people in that category that have educational degrees that we need in order to work with children and that we need in order to address their educational goals. So I've had many administrators say to me, oh, well, you know, nurses can't be administrators. Actually, they can. And we're not medical in the school anymore. We're working on the children's education, just like everybody else in that other category. So we should be educationally credentialed and we should have the right to move forward and move up. So just to explain the different categories, in New York State, and this is different for every state, and I apologize if you're watching from another state, I do hope to get information out to everybody else that's more geared toward your state. That will be something that is on the to-do list for the future. But in New York State, the Office of Teaching issues certificates in three different categories, teaching certificates, educational credentialing. Number one is classroom teachers, and that includes any classroom teacher, science, math, special education, gym, any teacher, speech and language therapist. I was supposed to correct this. I'm sorry, it's not a pathologist. But a speech and language therapist, they're included in the classroom teachers category, and also teacher of the deaf. They are all included in that category. The other category that are issued teaching certificates, again, school attendance teachers, counselors, dental hygiene, nurse, psychologist, and social worker. And then the last section where the teaching initiative department issues certificates is administrators and supervisors. So that 
um, the certificate can be a school district leader, such as a superintendent, or a skill school building leader, such as a principal. So those are the three sections of categories, basically, that you can get a certificate for teaching, educational credentialing, it's the same thing. So just to answer a question that I've heard over and over from the New York City DOE therapists, the term pedagogue means teacher. And in New York State Education Department, everybody on this slide, everybody who is issued a teaching certificate or an educational credentialing certificate is considered a pedagogue, an educator. They don't use the term pedagogue status. That is a New York City DOE terminology. So in New York State Education Department, these three categories of people are eligible for credentialing. So they're considered pedagogues. But they don't really use that language in New York State Education Department. But I just wanted to clarify what exactly that meant. So why does this matter? Why does it matter that OTs and PTs aren't on the list? Well, for one thing, we have no pathway to leadership. If you look at this cartoon, when I designed it, I didn't draw it. I had it drawn. But when I designed it, I just thought it was so reflective of what's going on with occupational therapy. We don't have a pathway to leadership. We can't move upward in our job. And that impacts our salaries and that impact, impacts our ability to provide for our families. And it's not supposed to be about money, of course, but this is you know, reality. And we do have to pay our bills and our student debt. And we did go to college, just like everybody else in this picture. So we should have the same opportunities to move forward and to work harder, to earn more, and to do more for the school communities. We don't have a seat at the administrative table right now. And because of that, we can't showcase our value. There's no occupational therapist at the team administrative meeting giving their two cents. And as you know, OTs, we have a unique ability to view things outside of the box. We are really creative. And we have a background in education. We have a background in mental health. And we have a background in group dynamics. So we have some really unique skills and not to mention our expertise in child development. We have some really unique skills that we could use to bring to the table that can really impact the school community for the better. And under ESSA, we should be having a voice in the school community. But because there are no leaders who are OTs and PTs, we really don't have that option. We really don't have that um, ability to do so. And then there's lack of parity. So this is something, again, that OTs are really upset about. They are not considered they, not that they're not considered equal, but they're not treated equally. It can affect their union memberships, it can affect their workspace, their schedules, their retirement, their salary, everything. There's no reason that we should be segregated from the other college educated professionals that we work with. We're segregated from our colleagues just because of this administrative wording within the New York State Education Department and other state education departments as well. So it really does impact the profession of occupational therapy, as well as the school systems. So just a comparative view. My group has done a great amount of research on this, and we felt that our best pathway would be to pursue the same pathway that New York school social workers have. And this is what's good for us in New York. I want to emphasize that this might not be what's appropriate or what's best for OTs in Kansas or California. There are different problems in each state, and that's why it needs to be a state by state um, you know, journey. And our goal for my group is to work with the states and help them to make it best for them. So in New York City, I'm sorry, in New York State, a school social worker gets, after they graduate school, they get a provisional certificate as a school social worker. Then they work within the school system for two years under the mentorship of a um, you know, experienced school social worker. After those two years of service, they're able to apply for a permanent certificate, an educational credential, just like all the other colleagues that I mentioned before. So they have to take a child abuse workshop, which some of us had to take also, fingerprinting clearance, I know I had to do that. And then if you wanted to look at the certification steps from start to finish, I have the link right there that I'll share on my website in a little while. But basically, school social workers graduate their program, their academic program, and then they get a job and they work for two years within the school system. And as we know, working within the school system is where you get your hands-on experience, where you get where you learn about the curriculum and you learn about you know the different nuances of working within a school. It doesn't mean that the OT education 
couldn't stand for some improvement and that we that that won't happen but basically they graduate and get a job and then they apply for this certificate and we just think that this would probably be the best pathway for occupational therapists and physical therapists within the school system because we wouldn't have to um, add extra tests or extra classes or anything like that. We would be, hopefully for the older therapists, not older, more experienced therapists, they would just be grandfathered in. And that's what we're looking to do. And I'm not saying that that is what will happen, but I'm saying that that's what we are advocating for. And that's what we have, through our research, determined would be the most appropriate pathway for occupational therapists and physical therapists to gain parity. So what could be the drawbacks to credentialing? There are always naysayers who say, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. There are going to be so many negative, you know, negative drawbacks to educational credentialing. What about the money? It doesn't mean anything's going to change. And well, you know, another therapist even said, you know, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do all this work? Why can't we just, because of all the work that we've done, just have educational credentialing? And it's, you know, well, we don't have it yet. It hasn't happened and no one's really listening. This educational credentialing tends to always be a sticking point for the state education department and from district to district. So there are 23 districts in New York that do give occupational therapists parity. They might be in the teacher's union. They might have equal pay to the rest of the, the um, staff, faculty, but the rest of the districts don't. And it varies district to district. Nothing changes overnight, but it's really a win-win situation, educational credentialing. And I'm not saying that, you know, this law is gonna pass and automatically we're all gonna get big fat raises and, and nice working environments and, you know, our schedule will be appropriate and not, you know, we won't be overworked or overpaid. A lot of our teachers are overworked as well and they have a tough schedule, but we're just looking for equality and it might take a while. If you think about historically, any minority group that had to fight for their rights and fight for equality, it didn't happen overnight, but it might, it might even take years for everything to really become equal and for them to be treated the same as everybody else. But for us, educational credentialing would be a step in the right direction, for sure. We always have people who don't like change. I don't want the principal to harass me. I don't want this to happen. I don't want to get supervised. Okay, well, those might be things in your mind that are negative about educational credentialing if that change does occur. But think about your colleagues. Are they harassed by the principal? Why would you be harassed by the principal? It doesn't, it shouldn't be that way. And if it is that way, having parity and having educational credentialing would give you a leg up in terms of advocating for yourself that you should be treated the same as everybody else. In terms of being supervised or observed, having, you know, how teachers are observed twice a year. I've been working in my school district for 18 years. I've never been observed. I would like to be observed. I want to show what OTs do. I want to show my skills. I want to show how I work with children. And I would love someone to give me some tips on ways that I could improve, but we don't have that. And many of us don't have that. I don't have that. And, um, you know, maybe other people could view it as a negative thing, but if it were to come with all that parity and the ability to advance towards leadership, then there may be some things that we're going to have to accept that might not be what we want. But for me personally, if, educational credentialing meant that I could go back to school and be an administrator and make more money and, and really showcase the value of occupational therapy, I would take some negative, um, some negative things such as being supervised or, you know, having to apply for a license once every four years, whatever the negative drawbacks might be. And there might be some, I, they might even be ones that we're not thinking of, but overall our group feels strongly that the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. And then there's always the cost analysis, short term and long term. Districts use the excuse really to cut costs. That's their job. They need to be fiscally responsible with the districts and the taxpayers' money. And so where they can cut costs, they will. But if we have educational credentialing, we've got a, a, a way to advocate for ourselves and to say, why aren't we the same as everybody else? And I just want to point out that in New York, in the 80s, social workers were not considered educationally credentialed either. So social workers have really, especially in New York State, done an outstanding job of advocating for themselves. And they have 
just come through so far and so high. If you read any of the stuff on the website for New York State Parent Teacher Association, they are advocating for more mental health counseling for students. They are advocating for, you know, um, more movement. And if you notice, it's always advocating for more social workers. So we need to show that we need OTs as well. Um, we need to advocate for ourselves. We need to come together. And if you look at that and the fact that in the 80s, social workers were not educationally credentialed and they weren't considered equal. But all these laws that have changed, especially recently with all the anti-bullying and um, you know character education, there's laws requiring social workers in elementary schools. There's no law about that in, uh, you know, for occupational therapists, but perhaps in 20 years there will be. So there's a lot of potential for us to really make a difference. So advocating for national support, we as a group have noticed that people are really willing to listen. We need to ask and we need to talk and we need to advocate. So we've done presentations at the National Conference for AOTA. We did Conversations That Matter where we were able to recruit multiple other group members from other states and that's how our um, USA school-based OTs looking for change group really was able to start expanding. The people that we met at that conversation did not matter. They were leaders and they they went back to their states and they gathered helpers, which is one of my favorite terms. And little by little, we've started trickling our information and our message out. The difference between now and the past is that now we have social media. So we can connect with people that we've never met before. We can find people that have the same goals as us you know, that live across the country. There's no need for all of us to be doing the same amount of work and the same work exactly on different sides of the nation. So this is why we're working together. Years ago, and I think it was 2017, AOTA leader Sandra Shefkind wrote a letter to every single state education department from AOTA talking about how occupational therapists are leaders in other settings. Their occupational therapists are routinely leaders in hospitals and clinics. We have the potential to be wonderful administrators in schools as well. Not one state, to my knowledge, at this point has acknowledged AOTA. She's a big wig and they didn't even answer her. So it just goes to show we really need to keep on the administrators. Legislation takes years to change. One thing I want to say is that on Tuesday, I went to Albany for Advocacy Day, Educational Advocacy Day. And it was amazing to see all the occupational therapists that were there gathering. And there were five motions that New York State OT Association was um, campaigning for. This isn't even on the table yet. Our quest for educational credentialing, it's not even not even a blip on the radar. I shouldn't say it's not a blip on the radar because they do know about it. And ISOTA has been very supportive of us, but we're not far enough to actually have a bill written to try to change the legislation. So a few of the questions were also like, you know, when is this going to happen? And is this going to happen next year? No, definitely not. It takes a long time and it takes a lot of power and a lot of work and a lot of know-how. So we're hoping to, from this webinar, gain more support. We'd love you to join our groups and help out in any way you can. It's not going to happen overnight. Every It's going to be a long haul, but we feel that it will be worth the work. You can also visit AOTA's legislation, Legislative Action Center. AOTA is working with um, IOTA to develop a strategy to delay or amend the proposal to allow licensure. So other states have things in the works as well. California is also... Um, is also working on a bill to get credentialing and um, they actually put it forth last year and it didn't, it wasn't approved, but they're advocating again, they're doing it all over again because that's what it takes. So be the change. Last year at AOTA, or maybe it was the year before, Amy Lamb, the president of AOTA gave this amazing speech. It was so motivating and so inspiring. And she said that we need to be the change, that if something is stagnant and we're not happy with it, we need to fix it, not complain. And her term was, if an opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. And that is what we are doing with this advocacy. We want to have a campaign. We want to make the change. It's not going to happen for us if we don't push for it. No one else is going to do it for us. We need to do it for ourselves and we need to do it together. 
So advocating for state support. Again, the states have been listening. In New York, the NYSOTA has been wonderful to us and willing to help us in any way they can. We are in the process of doing some research for New York State occupational therapists, as I mentioned before, and we can't wait to give the information from that research out to the state and the stakeholders that need to know it. So if you are not a member of the social media sites, look to see if your state has an OTs looking for change group. Most of them are linked in the USA, school-based OTs looking for change group, but not all. So if you have a specific question about your state or if you're willing to start your state group, right now it's not a lot of work at all, but please email me at MissJamieOT at Gmail and I will be very glad to get you started. Most states are in the gathering helpers phase. New York, California, and Illinois are a little bit further ahead. So that's exciting. But we want to, again, work with you to give our work to you so that you don't have to do more work than necessary. So again, at NYSOTA, the New York State OT Conference, we just recently presented about this matter. And um, we also presented at the Connecticut OT Association just a couple weeks ago. And both were really well received. People are learning about this. People are intrigued and they're on board for the most part. There's always going to be people who are scared of change or just um, you know scared of the unknown. And there will be, of course, unknown things that happen. So you know, those people are more hesitant, but as we educate them about the possible positive effects, we're, we're, uh, we're pulling them over to our side. So again, California has a bill that is introducing credentialing for OTs and a work group is reporting on the findings and Idaho, I think I might've said Illinois, I'm sorry. Idaho is also working towards credentialing. So this is really just great, great stuff. Promoting change. So we need to study the impact of this change and also determine the requirements. That is why we have this survey um, in the works for New York and each state will need to do their own survey. As I said, the legislation is different and also the issues for OTs and PTs are different in each state. We need to engage in a trusting relationship with our, um, you know, the other OTs within our state and let them know how everybody's thinking. I know for me, I'm very pro-educational credentialing, but I do acknowledge other people's concerns and fears about it. Um, we need to explore the changes in educational credentialing and what are the steps. And um, just a side note, I do have a professional webinar in development right now that will go into detail very much about the steps toward educational credentialing. And this would be nationally for each state can take this webinar and really break down the steps to advocating for your state and basically realizing what it is that you need to do and how to do it. And I'm um, very excited. It is in development. It's not ready yet, but it will be hopefully, um, you know, ready to be published in a month or so. It's important to identify the stakeholders, the people that we need to convince, the people that we need to reach, superintendents, directives of special education, the New York State Licensing Board, Board of Regents, New York State OT Association, and AOTA, your state association, colleges and universities that have OT programs. We need to educate the future OTs, the future school OTs. So many people don't even know that OTs have this issue and PTs. Many students who are interested in pediatrics, they have no idea that if they get a job in a school in New York, that the chances are that they will not be paid equally to their peers or that they have no way towards an administrative position or to be higher up. And many people don't want a leadership position. They don't want to be higher up. They're content. That's fine. It's fine for you to be content with that. But think about your profession and think about your colleagues who want more. Shouldn't they have the right? Shouldn't they have the opportunity? Absolutely, of course they should. Just because you don't want it doesn't mean we shouldn't have it. OTs who work in the field are hired directly by districts and some of them are hired by contracts or agencies and same with physical therapists and that can impact them as well. For the agencies, it might have some negative impacts which might bring us some you know, negative feedback about this, about this quest for credentialing if it's going to take, if it's going to lead to districts hiring directly, then that would impact the agencies. We don't know what's going to happen, you know, but it definitely is something that could potentially happen. It makes sense. So we need to acknowledge the cost factor. It would cost the districts to hire OTs and it would cost them to 
pay the OTs that they have now equally to the other colleagues and the other teachers if they're not already doing so. So, you know, money doesn't come out of thin air. That has to be acknowledged. However, again, with the social workers, when the laws said that there needs to be social workers within the elementary schools, districts had to hire social workers. They got money from somewhere else. It just worked. The amount of OTs in each district is minimal compared to their entire faculty and their entire staff. So that's something that needs to be considered. But, you know, there's there's costs that happen all the time. There's always, you know, new problems and new costs for the budget. So when we think long term about the impact that occupational therapists could have on the big level, if OTs were pushing into kindergartens and doing RTI as they should be under ESSA, they would be catching these kids early and getting rid of children who are going to be referred in fourth grade and getting OT for years. Instead, they'd be seen under the RTI model for a year, maybe two, and then they'd be discharged and their motor skills would be appropriate, which would be better for their math and literacy as well. So we can always go around in a circle and say why it's better cost wise, but the districts and the education department is always going to have their, you know, fiscal responsibilities at a high priority. So looking towards the future, we want to gather more occupational therapy practitioners to support our campaign. We want to align with legislators to impact change. It's really important to tell them our stories and to get their support and to tell them why it impacts occupational therapists. In, you know, as I said about affecting the students and affecting the school community, but it also affects the profession of occupational therapy. There's a shortage of school-based therapists working within New York and I'm sure there's a shortage in other states as well. This causes skilled practitioners who are, who are creative and brilliant and wonderful to leave school-based practice. They need to support their family. They want a, a position where they can, you know, become an administrator or advance either financially or professionally. And so they're leaving school-based practice. And who does that impact? The children. So it's really important that we have that you know, knowledge and the ability to really advocate. It is about the kids, even though it's about us as well. It's so that we can help the kids. And we went into this to help the children. So it's important to make sure that you have that message when you talk to administrators or anyone about what we're trying for. So AOTA Centennial Vision is we envision that occupational therapy is powerful, widely recognized, science-driven, and evidence-based profession with globally connected and diverse workforce meeting society's occupational needs. Personally, I feel that in New York, school-based practice is not meeting the centennial vision. And that was supposed to be achieved in the past. They have a new vision that we're supposed to be working towards, but we haven't even achieved this. We can't be powerful and widely recognized if we don't have a seat at the table. We need the ability to be leaders. We need the ability to be administrators. We need the ability to be created and treated equally to our peers, social workers, teachers, psychologists, speech therapists. There's no reason for us to be segregated. And we need parity in order to be powerful and widely recognized. We need time in our schedule and fair schedules and caseloads in order to do the work to be using evidence-based practice and to make sure that our, you know, our OT treatments are the best that they can be and that we are doing the best we can for the students. Vision 2025 from AOTA is that occupational therapy maximizes health, well-being, and quality of life for all people, populations, and communities through effective solutions that facilitate participation in everyday living. So how that applies to children is the quality of life for all people and all populations. We should be working more with the entire community of the school, with all of the children, with all of the teachers, all of the staff. We shouldn't be in this little bubble of working within special education or pulling our children out and going to the little you know, closet down the hallway to work with them for 30 minutes and then bring them back. Hopefully by you know, 2025, we will have achieved educational credentialing and we will be much more on a path to parity. That is my hope and my goal. So realizing our potential, credentialing of occupational therapy practitioners in New York State, it's a win-win. It's a win-win for the children, for the faculty, and for occupational therapists. We have so much that we can offer to the school community, and we need the pathway to do so. We can work with the general student population to realize health, well-being, and also to incorporate our mental health background. 
OTs could be running social skills group. OTs could be running character education programs and um, transition programs for children who are in school until the age of 21. Occupational therapists can be doing all of these things, but in many cases they aren't. And other professions are taking over. And you know, not that they are not also qualified to do so, but so are we. And very often we're not being utilized to the fullness of our potential. So these are just some of the references that myself and the other members of OTs Looking for Change have put together for these presentations. This is a presentation that was put together by um, all of us, all five of us, and I just adapted it for this webinar to, um, you know, gear towards the questions that people have been asking me. So I have a list of all the questions that people have asked me, tons and tons of questions. So I feel that I addressed a lot of them, but the ones that I didn't address are specific to where you work and exactly what you do. So again, I can't unfortunately answer those questions. I don't know exactly what would be best for your state, how the um, advocacy should go for your state. I do wanna help your state and I will help your state. If your state does not have a group, please consider starting it. It's really not a lot of work. It might be a little work going forward, but right now you'd be in the gathering helpers phase. And that is where you get other members from your state to join you and, um, you know, you have a team so that it's not all on you. And it's not all on me. And I, I, as I said before, my group of five, we have been really working together and divvying out, um, you know, the workload of this campaign. So some people are asking, you know, what classes are needed to get a credential? Would it be CEUs? Would we have to go back to school? Again, for each state, it would be different. In New York, that is not what we're advocating for. We don't want that. We want to follow the pathway of social workers, which would just be working within the school system for two years and then being able to apply for a certificate. So we're, we don't want that. And we're, we're not going to go that way for any state. Um, but again, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I cannot predict the future, but that's not what we are wanting to do. Some people are saying, if we become part of the teachers union, can they lower our pay to match what the teachers make? So I'm assuming you don't work in New York because OTs do not make what teachers make, and we wish we did. In California, OTs and PTs make more than teachers. And so if that were the case, that would not be something we would advocate for. Obviously, you don't want a pay cut. That would just be silly. So that's why each state needs to go and advocate separately to, to make sure that they go for exactly what is the right move for them and for the therapists within their district and what they're advocating for. Some people want to know why on earth are people opposed to this? Why would anyone not want educational credentialing? And again, um, I, I very often talk about the bubble and the bubble is people who work just within a very small group and they're really only thinking of what's going on again in their building and their district A, building B, and how's it going to impact me, Susie Jones, and will my principal, you know, Mr. T, do this to me? We don't know, you know, but that's not what we're aiming for. We want to look at the big picture, look at all of the USA, and then look at your whole state. That's a big picture. And the, the truth is, yes, there would be change, but we're hoping that the changes would be much more positive than negative. And change can be scary. People are scared of the unknown, but, you know, it's a much bigger issue. that It also reflects, you know, the lack of respect and the lack of value that OTs and PTs are receiving within the school system. They can't say they respect us and value us if they are refusing to treat us equally and refusing to give us a seat at the table. Um, people are saying, whose fault is it? Why are we in this position? And my answer is it's partially our fault. I hate to say that, but we really haven't spoken up. We should have been fighting for this for years. I know myself personally, I got my first school district position in 2001, and I was placed in the civil service union in 2004. And I was uninformed. I did not realize that that impacted me, um, you know, financially in terms of, you know, who's going to represent me if I got in trouble? You know, who represents me? The, the president of the civil service union. And that's generally um, someone from the maintenance staff or one of the bus drivers or the leader of transportation. So here I am at a meeting trying to explain why I chose a particular chair for a student based on his ergonomic needs. 
um, and his health safety. And the person who is representing me doesn't really know what I do for a living. And, you know, of course, that's nothing against the people who are in the civil service union. I think in some states, you guys call that being classified and not being in the teachers union. Um, but, you know, we do have a college education and we do have the student debt that goes with that. And we do work directly with the children on their academic goals. So that, you know, is something definitely to be said. It's not necessarily that if this educational credentialing passes that your union is going to change. That's a whole separate issue, but it certainly would give us some, um, you know, something to grab onto in terms of fighting for the appropriate union or the equal union to the other staff members. Most of these questions are in regards to particular states. So I'm going to defer to your state administrator that you could ask them those questions in your state group. Again, if you don't have a state group, please consider starting one or at least post your questions in the USA School-Based OTs Looking for Change group. We will try to help you out and um, you know, perhaps there's someone who knows the answer to your question in that group. Um, people are saying, other than the career ladder as being an administrator, what would be the benefits of educational credentialing? And I hope after this webinar that you know the benefits. A pathway to leadership is one of them, but consider, even if you didn't want a pathway to leadership, if your boss was an OT, if your superintendent was an OT, do you think that the children would be sitting at furniture that's way too big for them if the person who was in charge of everybody was an occupational therapist? Do you think that OTs would be working in closets and, um, you know, on the stage or in the cafeteria or, you know, lugging a bag of supplies from place to place? Maybe, but doubtfully, because OTs would have the respect and they would know. And if your leader was an OT, they would really understand what you did and they'd have a voice at the table, which could really impact you and your quality of, of work, you know, and, and your job satisfaction. I know that it would improve mine. So those are some other reasons why, you know, it would be a positive thing for all of us. So I think that I pretty much addressed everybody else's questions. Um, what do we need to put this in place so it becomes a reality? Awesome question. So as I said, I have a professional webinar in development. It's pending CEUs from NYSOTA, and I can't even wait to get started on it. We'll also have a workbook available that will break down the steps to achieving this for your state. It'll let you know what you can do as well as what um, your state can do or what your group can do. It gives you everything really broken down. Um, I know that this was a lot of information and I hope that it was understandable and helpful, but the professional webinar that's coming out will be um, something that you'll be able to take one module at a time and this way it's not that you're set to watch it on Saturday at 12 o'clock um, and you would be getting CEUs from it, but it would also give you that information as to what you need to do to make this happen, which is very exciting. I wanted to let you know as well that AOTA made school leadership a priority for 2019. So they issued a list of what their goals and priorities for the year were going to be. And for the first time, school-based leadership is on that list. So I'm so excited about that. And I think it really reflects the hard work we've done and the fact that OTs are being heard. We're speaking up and we're being heard. In the past, we weren't speaking up. So I even had someone from NYSOTA say to me, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really bother anybody. Nobody complains about it. Well, that's a problem. Just because no one's complaining doesn't mean it's an issue. So it is important to present your concerns professionally to the people, the stakeholders that are the ones making the decisions to help us. So I'm going to post this video so that you can watch it at a later date or share it. I would appreciate if you would do that. That would be very helpful to me. And I will add some links on the bottom of this page that you can also learn more. I did a podcast with Jason Davies, who is the one of the administrators of our California group. And um, we speak about educational credentialing and the impact. And particularly with California, there's a lot of terminology that is happening in California that I didn't even know. So Jason gave me some great information about that. And I'll post the link to that podcast below, as well as some other important links. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that you learned you know, what educational credentialing is, and then I answered your questions. Again, um, 
this is a very important topic to me. I'm very passionate about it, which is why I'm sitting here on an hour on a Saturday and giving this information. It is really crucial that we achieve this and I think we deserve it. We're smart and we are creative and we deserve equal treatment in the school system and a pathway to leadership. So thank you very much for joining me. And please, if you have any um, more questions, post them in the USA School-Based OTs Looking for Change Facebook group. If you're not a member of that group, I will post the link to that underneath on this webpage as well. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.